Welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. Engineers are pre-programmed to solve problems. If you're standing in a queue at the bank, you're figuring out an optimized queuing approach. And if you see someone doing a repetitive task on the laptop, you'll be there with a script to automate it. We're always analyzing, thinking, and improving. And it will have happened more than once that you've considered turning that new idea into a product. But how can you be sure that what you've invented, your it, is going to be successful? Can you turn ideas into a business that will sustain you as well as, or better than, just being an employee? Or should you just ignore that urge and move on? Someone who has plenty of experience with ideas that turned into both successful and unsuccessful businesses is Alberto Savoia, my expert for this episode and author of the book, The Right It, Why So Many Ideas Fail and How to Make Sure Yours Succeed. This episode is sponsored by TME. Products for makers and hobbyists are a solid and growing segment of the TME product portfolio. The most popular are Arduino boards, ranging from the iconic Uno Rev 3 through to the MKR and Nano series, and all the way up to the Portenta boards, focused on the needs of professional developers. Arduino's latest addition to the lineup, the Uno Rev 4 Minima and Uno Rev 4 Wi-Fi, can also be ordered directly from the website at tme.eu. As someone who has had plenty of ideas for businesses and one failed startup behind him, I was very keen to learn more from Alberto, especially if he'd cracked the formula for guaranteeing startup success. Because this show is recorded, there is no question and answer session this time. However, if you do have any questions, join the conversation by dropping your comments here on YouTube. Both Alberto and I are also available on LinkedIn or if you prefer, reach out on Twitter with hashtag ElectorEI or via the Elector website. I started by asking Alberto to tell us a little bit more about who he is, where he's from, and what he does today. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for having me. You know, I, I love Electro magazine and what it, what it does. I'm a real tinker and I, I love to mess up with electronics. So uh, this is my audience. I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. So my background, I was uh, born in Italy. When I was 17 years old, I came to the US. I landed in Silicon Valley. And you know, I had a great time right in the late uh, 70s. And I got a degree in uh, math and computer science. And uh, then I, be I will always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I love to build uh, things. So I, when the IBM PC first came out, I asked my dad, my first venture capitalist for a $5,000 loan to buy one. It was, a, it was seven months of rent at the time. Wow. He bought me one and I told him, Dad, I will pay you within a year. So I started using it to write some uh, video games for the IBM PC because at the time all they had this boring, you know, VisiCalc application. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my first entrepreneurial experience. Uh, after that, I was very lucky to be hired by Sun Microsystems when it was a little small company and then it became a Fortune 50 company. So I was there 30 years as a software engineering, then a manager, then director of uh, software research. Uh, after which I got the bug and I said, look, I want to do another startup. So I did my, I left Sun. I did my first startup uh, called Belogic. We raised $3 million in VC funding and I sold it for $100 million. So 30x return. Everybody was happy. Uh, then after that, I was lucky enough to be hired by another company that was a small startup and became a very successful company, Google. Uh, and um, so I was at Google for a while. Then I left Google to do another startup because I thought at the time, look, I'm pretty good at the startup things, right? Every company I start is a success. Every company I join is a success. So, you know, Google will be successful with or without me. So I did my second startup and uh, we raised $25 million and spent five years building a product that a lot of people told us, if you build it, we will buy it. It will be a great success. So we built it. It worked exactly as we said it would and very, very few people bought it. So that was my first failure. And that's what led me to uh, think about uh, the fact that, you know, I, I thought that it was me, that I was great at picking the right ideas and building them right. And then I learned that, you know, I was four times lucky to start the right product in the right startup. 
And at the fifth time, you know, kind of a, the, what I call the beast of failure bit me in the butt. And I decided to do something about it. So I kind of shifted my career. And now my goal is to help entrepreneurs, innovators, inventors to make sure that they don't invest their very valuable time and resource to build products that uh, are not destined to succeed in the market. There's a really uh, exciting and interesting story there. The, you know, the way you describe it and also looking at your LinkedIn profile, anyone looking at that would say, hey, this guy is eminently qualified to build further successful startups. And, and like you said, you, you got to this, uh, to this third startup and, uh, and it failed. What did you do after it failed? How did you feel having sort of spent all that time and money and then like losing employees? Uh, and, and what did you find out through that process? Well, I, I felt horrible, right? I mean, the, the venture capitalists, uh, they, you know, that's part of their business, right? They, they invent in 10 companies, eight or nine will fail. The other one is the next Google. Uh, so I, I didn't feel too bad for them. You know, that's how the game works. But, you know, over the five years, we hired, you know, uh, almost 100 people and uh, who committed to us uh, and, you know, who had the stock options. So when it didn't work out, yeah, I, I really felt bad for everybody. And that is what motivated me to look at and answer the question, how is it possible that and we hire great people, right? We have, we have the best people, we have the best venture capitalists in the Valley, Sequoia Capital and, uh, and NEA, we raised $25 million. So we had plenty of money. People told us the product would work, we had great advisor, everything was lined up. And then when we built it, you know, it just failed. So it led me to think, how is it possible, right? What did we do wrong? And it turns out that we built it right. We built what we said we were going to build. We built it right. But we built what I call the wrong it. A product that doesn't matter how well you build it or market it is not going to succeed in the market. So it led me to think, how can I find out if a product is going to be the right it? So I kind of made a full shift in my career. I went back to Google. By the time also Google was starting to build a lot of products that were not the right it, right? Yeah. Remember Google Glass, Google Wave. Google Plus, right? Very successful company. Uh, you know, even Microsoft had, had a few few doubts, right? Their the version of the iPod was not a success. You know, even Apple, even Steve Jobs had some failure with the, uh, with the Newton. So yeah. it doesn't matter how competent you are, past performance and past success is no evidence of future success. I thought, can I use my scientific training, my engineering approach to come up with a way to maximize the chances of success, you know, very systematically? And that's been my work for the past uh, 11, 12 years. Now, I am part of uh, this illustrious club. I also created a business and, and it failed. I didn't spend quite as much money as you. <laughs> Probably a hundredth or a thousandth, I think, of uh, a millionth maybe, maybe of, uh, of, of what was invested in, in your business. Um, but as I went through that process of trying to start a business, um, obviously you, you go to various techs, you look at various websites, and it's all about you need a good business plan and you need a great team. So why is the plan and the team not enough? Well, so yeah, let's talk about business plan. I've, I've written about a dozen business plan and I've read, you know, a few hundreds because, uh, you know, I, I've also worked with the VC do, helping them to do due diligence. Now, let me tell you, most business plans are a, a work of fiction. In fact, my short shortcut, I call them BS plan, right? Because that's mostly uh, BS. Uh, I put a video on YouTube a while back where I told I teach people how to redact the business plan. So take three or four different color markers, right? So anything that is an assumption, you know, use, I don't know, the red highlighter. Anything that is uh, some belief or some hope, use the black market and so on and so forth. So once you eliminate uh, or something that is irrelevant, like information, this other company succeeded, uh, you know, doesn't mean that you will succeed. So redact everything. Now, what happens when you redact a business plan? the way I do, you're left at most with half a page worth of, uh, of material. The rest is fiction, especially the five-year financial projection using a spreadsheet. I've done a lot of those. None of those materializes. Some of them came nowhere near because they, they were much less. And some of them went through the roof. I mean, look at how successful Google is. You know, Google thought that we're probably going to be a $10 billion company. You know, it's not what? A trillion dollar company so yeah uh, completely uh, completely useless and by the way investors and vcs know that as far as a great team yeah a great team is necessary you know i would say the business plans are kind of optional you know it's because because they're just like future thinking uh, a team uh, a great team is essential but you can put 
a great team with the wrong product and you're going to fail, right? As I like to say, if there's no market, uh, there is no way. So the number one thing that you need to do is to make sure that you have the right it, which I define as a product that if you build it and execute it competently, will succeed in the market. Like you say, um, ideas are sort of ten a penny. There's loads of people out there um, proposing something that they've they've thought of, which uh, seems like a good idea, and and we'll look at them and go, well, that's that one seems good, and another one will come along. You don't really see how that's gonna how that's gonna fly. That's doomed to fail. How do you go about determining if your it, if your idea is going to be a winner? Right. So uh, for, the first thing I do is I, I, I use very precise language, right? Probably your readers and viewers are all engineers, right? So they're not going to say, well, I'm going to use, you know, a big resistor, right? And that's, what, you, that's not enough, right? You know, how, how many ohms, right? How many watts uh, are you going to include? So first of all, precise language. I don't use good ideas or bad ideas, right? Because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I have a really bad idea for a business. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to start this company. So that's why I came up with the definition. The right it defined as a product that if competently executed will succeed and the wrong it, a product that no matter how well you execute it, uh, will fail in the market. So that's the first thing. Now, the next question is, will a product be the right it? Well, you know, we're not dealing with electrons here. We're dealing with human beings and market. So there is no certainty. There is no 0% chance of success or 100% chance of success. So the best answer that we can give is in terms of probability of success. So I put probability of success in five buckets because we cannot be precise, right? You cannot say there is a 67.783% probability of success. So very unlikely, uh, unlikely, 50-50, likely, and very likely. So this map into 10%, 30%, 50%, 70%, and 90% chance of success. So that's the best answer that you could give. Will it succeed? You can give a probability. And then what do you do? You do experiment uh, that test your key hypothesis to, to determine how likely it is uh, that you know, it's going to be 50% probable probability of success or 70% uh, probability of success. So it's an experimental uh, method. We start with an assumption, a hypothesis, and then we test our hypothesis. So um, obviously um, engineers will be sort of, uh, like you say, looking for numbers, looking for actual data to, to make that, that, that sort of test and uh, an assumption. But I think one of the first things that's going to go through an engineer's mind is, oh, okay, so what you're telling me then is I need to get my prototype working. I need my vid minimum viable product. Right. Um, but by definition, um, you know, depending what it is, if uh, it might be something simple, but we might be talking about uh, a, a new type of uh, uh, implantable heart, for example. And, and that's, uh, you know, these things take, take a lot of time, a lot of cost uh, in order to, you know, e even get to, to something that's sort of starting to work. I is there a better way? The, the, yes, you know, I, 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 I'm never happy when, when I'm, in, I'm super happy when I'm in front of, you know, soldering iron or, you know, or, or, or a compile. So I like to build stuff, right? What I don't like is that I build stuff when I could have been, that fails, when I could have been building stuff that actually succeeds. So I want to make a difference. I, I invented a new term called pretotyping. Uh, why? Because I, like many, I spend too much time and money building prototypes for products that then eventually fail. So uh, here I, I have some visual aids, right? So this is what a prototype looks like. So this is a prototype for a, a passive audiophile tone control that I was planning uh, to build. You know, it's kind of as a hobby, but you know, if people wanted to buy, I would have, uh, I would have done that. So a prototype has wires, our stuff, you know, just a lot of, um, uh, you know, you, a prototype asks and answers the question, can we build it and will it work? Right. So that's why you build pro, uh, prototypes. A prototype, on the other hand, is something that you, it's an artifact, but the artifact doesn't have to be functional. It, it's something that you use to imagine, uh, to, to use your imagination and other people's imagination to see if the market is interested in that. So this is a prototype for a tone control. This, this actually works, right? You, you kind of plug in, you know, your inputs and outputs there and it does something. Uh, this is the prototype that I built. Now, it looks like it's functioning, right? But I haven't figured out yet the, the actual circuit because I want to, you know, I actually spent months 
trying to come up with a precise uh, calibration. But I knew what it, I wanted it to look like. So it's a, it's a big thing, you know, it has a inputs and output and a, and a nice knob. There is nothing inside this. But I used this and I took photos and I created a website. People can go and look at it. Uh, it's called deliciousdecibels.com. So I'm not selling anything, you know, I just left it there for historical artifacts of me showing uh, pre-totapping. So what I did I, as a first step, I showed them what this tone, what this device would look like and what it would do. It's like a loudness uh, circuit for, uh, you know, for audio files. And then use that to see if there is interest. So I told them, if you are interested in this device, you know, it would cost, I don't know, $499. Uh, send, me, send me your email and I'll keep you up to date. So that's a big difference between a prototype and a prototype. And I want to show you a, another one. If you like, you like to see actual show and tell, I love to do show and tell. Yeah, me too. Right. So one of the prototyping techniques I teach is called the Pinocchio prototype. So Pinocchio, remember, was the puppet who pretended to be a boy. So in a Pinocchio, um, what you do is you don't actually, in this case, you don't test the market. You just, just test it if you would use it. So when I heard that Amazon was about to launch this launch these uh, smart speakers, I thought, would I buy them? And I thought, well, I'm going to use prototype. So I took a can of beans, uh, you know, pinto beans, uh, and you know, I put a little uh, wrap around it, and I kind of drew with a marker what I think the device would look like. So this is a microphone. This is a speaker. You know, on top it has some controls for volume, uh, on and off. And then what I did, I, I put it in various places inside my house. So in the kitchen, you know, in the, in the bedroom, in my office, and I pretended, right? Pretendotype. Think of it as pretendotype. Pretended that it worked. So I would say, and I called it Hal, right? I had no idea what Alexa would be called. So I would say Hal, like in 2001, a space odyssey. Uh, how's the weather today? Of course, it didn't talk to me because it's a can of beans, right? So beans, <laughs> I would have gone crazy if they replied. But I, I tested what I would use it for. I would say, you know, what is the weather? Can you give me, I don't know, uh, some news or can you play some uh, Led Zeppelin uh, for me? And that way I realized I collected my own data that if I had one of these devices, I would actually use it. So when Amazon, I would say about six months later, launched the, the first Alexa. And here is, the, so this is a prototype. It doesn't do anything. It's a can of beans, right? But I used it to pretend that it was working. So it's funny when actually Alexa came out about the about one of the first one. It looked a lot just taller. It looked a lot like my prototype. It, and I knew I would need three, one in the bedroom, one in the kitchen, and one in my study. And it just spanned out perfectly. So that's the difference between prototypes and uh, prototypes. I love that so much. I, I remember seeing the photo in the book, and I just thought that was absolutely brilliant. And, and I didn't realize that you still had it. <laughs> I still have it. Look at it today. I think that's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> So we've got to the point now where you've convinced yourself that you think this is a, a useful product. This could be your it. Um, so the, the next thing is then to see if other people think it is as well. And if we go back to our business plan, um, I'll admit when, I, when I've written a business plan and when I've looked at other people's, it seems to be that when you get to sort of market information, it seems to be enough if you if you reference a KPMG report and pack in a couple of uh, images from Statista on on historical data, um, you know, you, you've more, more or less done your, your market research. What sort of market data do you like to see to be convinced that the, the that it's going to be more than one person buying the product? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So what, uh, one of the things I learned at Google, uh, you know, it has two mantras. One of them is data beats opinion, and the other one is say it with numbers. By the way, if you go and look at some of the most successful companies, the ones that are in the trillion dollar categories these days, they, they live by these mantras, data beats opinion, uh, say it with numbers. So I started to tell people, you need, you need data, not opinion. You don't say, I think this will succeed. Uh, but there's two types of data, because people, you know, as you said, Oh, you want data? Here's data. Here's a KP, KPMG report from uh, five years ago about the market for such and such is uh, $14 billion. So if we get 0.1% of that market, you know, that's a ton of money. Uh, that's what I call OPD. It sounds like OCD, right? Uh, OPD, other people's data. And that's very dangerous for two reasons. And the first reason is, is that just because others have succeeded with a similar product to yours doesn't mean you will succeed. The other one is that just because others have failed 
with similar product to yours doesn't mean that you will fail. So for example, what an example of successes. So Apple was super successful with the smartphone, with the iPhone. Google and Android followed up. They were really su uh, successful too. Then Amazon, another gigantic, very successful company came up with the Fire Phone and that failed, right? So just because Apple and Google succeeded doesn't mean that Amazon would succeed. Let's look at the flip side. Uh, let's look at the history of electric cars before Tesla. It, 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 you know, it's a graveyard of failure. So you know, if Tesla, if Elon Musk has, had looked at that data, OPD, other people's data, they would have never started an electric car company. Fortunately for them, I guess for the investor, they ignore that and they built their own car company. So just because others have failed doesn't mean that you will fail. And just because others have succeeded doesn't mean that you will succeed. So what do you do? You collect your own data. So as we, with this little gizmo, I created my own website. I went to a, a forum where there are audio files and I said, hey, guys, well, it's mostly guys, right? In fact, 99.9%, yeah. <laughs> you know, probably like this audience. <laughs> hey guys, I'm building this, this device is a fancy tone control that replaces the loudness control that people no longer include. If you're interested, send me an email, private message, and if I end up building it, I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. So I collected 30 or 40 uh, messages and you know, they knew that it was gonna cost you know, three to $400. So that's what I call skin in the game, right? So the, the, it, people giving you their email address is the smallest form of skin in the game. So I took all these addresses, say 50 people, I forget the exact numbers, that sent me their email address. So after, I, and that I did with the prototype, right? With this, well, it didn't do anything. Then I built the prototype because I want to make sure that I could deliver uh, the goods. And then I, I sent another uh, test. So I picked those 50 people and I said, hey, you said that you were interested in this. Uh, now, if I, I, I've built it, here are the curves, here's how it's going to work. I did a little video. If you send me a deposit for $50, you're going to be in the mailing, I know you're going to be among the first to buy. So, and I received, I believe, 12 deposits for $50. So that, that is more skin in the game, right? An email address is a small piece of evidence. A $50 de deposit is a lot uh, of evidence. And so that's how I proceeded in collecting my own data about my own device, not about past, you know, tone de control devices and uh, in my own data with skin in the game. And that's what I call Yoda, your own data, as opposed to OPD, other people's data. So that's, uh, I think that's a great way forward. And it's, it's very, very simple, isn't it? At the end of the day, I think um, in the book, you talk about this idea of being in thought land. I think most engineers, yes. I know I spend a lot of time in thought land. You're thinking about something, it seems, and you, you end up convincing yourself more and more. But like you say, um, being able to convince somebody else and not just one, but a lot of people and then get skin in the game, get some, some money on the table. Um, those that's actually much, much more powerful. Um, the, the idea of obviously the, 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 the process that you've just described around the tone control is, is relatively straightforward. You're, you're, you're US based, uh, you know, your US market, they're relatively close by and everything can be done relatively easy by, um, by the internet. But there's obviously other situations where you actually need to talk to people, um, actually interact with them maybe. And let's say you're currently in California, you've, you've developed a, a new solution for a problem you've seen in China. Do you physically need to go there to test your hypothesis in, in China as well to get that that Yoda, that um, own data? Or are there other ways about uh, yeah, I would you say, can go about you it? Know, not necessarily, because these days you can uh, collect. By, by the way, you mentioned, say, talk to people. I, I, I'm not a big believer in interviews, in focus group, in any of that stuff. So to me, that's uh, that's opinion. That's not data, right? Doesn't come with skin in the game. To me, a thousand people that say, hey, Alberto, I will buy your tone control, count as zero. One person that gives me, you know, $50 to buy it, that to me, that is the only validation that matters. So having said that, no, the first thing I do, because I get that question a lot, say, hey, yeah, I live in, um, I don't know, in Kansas, you know, landlocked, and I invented a new type of surfboard. And I said, well, you know, but if you're in Kansas, you know, in this case, what do you develop a, a surfboard. So I usually encourage people to think locally. I mean, think globally, but start to, to act locally. So the first thing I would say is, look, if you're not a surfer, you know, and you're not in a place where there are surfers, why do you want to start with that? You know, if you're in Kansas, maybe some in, in 
clever way of surfing equipment, uh, or sorry, of farming equipment, or maybe a surfboard that you know you can surf. Uh, I don't know grain, uh, uh, cornfields, something like that. So the first thing is why, if you're here, you want to make a market there. To me, a lot of the time, that's an excuse because you know you you mentioned that people live in Thotland. People like to stay in Thotland because they can avoid rejection there, right? So market rejection hurts as much as romantic rejection, right? So you, you want to ask somebody out on a date and you resist, you wait. Well, you maybe Prim said, well, maybe I'm going to lose 10 pounds and then I'll be ready to ask for a date. So every time I see all these delay tactics, all this distance, I suspect that these people are afraid to make contact uh, with the real market. So having said that, let's assume that you are in California for some reason, your answer addresses a problem in China, very inefficient in my opinion. Uh, it, you you can go there, but you're going to waste time and money uh, just traveling there and, you know, and, and dealing with the culture that you should be spending to do a prototype locally. So you know, if you really want to reach the Chinese market, maybe try to do something online if you can collect data uh, that way. Now, I've got your book here, the, the Write It. This is uh, sort of the basis for all of the discussion that we're, we're having here today. I've, I've read it through it and it's, it's got plenty of little notes in the side there. So I'd love, I've, love been, to do that. I've been through it with a fine tooth comb. And um, the, 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 the term, the skin in the game, I mean, that really shines through the whole book. And obviously, again, like you said, it makes absolute sense. If, if someone's willing to give you $50 for a um you know to for pre-ordering or even even buy pay the full amount up front um yeah. that's a really really good piece of skin in the game so if that's the case then one of the questions that comes to my mind is uh, you you must love platforms like uh, kickstarter and indiegogo or maybe not what what's your opinion on those yeah so i love kickstarter and indiegogo i think they're a fantastic resource for entrepreneurs for builders for innovators but they're not the best way to validate your idea. Kickstarter is a funding platform. It's not a market validation platform, right? Uh, it's, uh, and it's not a good market validation platform because the people that go on Kickstarter and Indiegogo are what we call innovators and early adopters, which are just the, the very beginning of the market. If your idea is meant for a broader audience, for the general public, you're not going to get the validation that you need. And plus, honestly, to do a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo campaign is a lot more effort than building a prototype, building a landing page on your uh, website. So love Kickstarter and Indiegogo if used for their intended purposes, which is to fund your idea. And I mean, you don't use it to validate it. And then the other kind of possible drawback Sometimes, you know, many times, you know, I have friends and people that, you know, bought a Kickstarter product and then they were not able to deliver. So, you know, it sucks for both sides, you know. Yeah. Oh my God, I got 20,000 order for a Pebble watch. You know, now I actually got to build it. I'm not sure about that. Uh, can, can I show you another quick prototype since you showed my book, right? Yes, so please. Yeah. Books are in the other categories of most, most books fail in the market. You know, so it's, it takes a lot of time and it's not fun to build a book. You know, <laughs> a word processor is not as fun as a soldering iron and, and an oscilloscope. So before I decided to write the book, this guy, you know, properly published, HarperCollins, you know, beautifully bound book, I prototyped my book. And while I was at Google in 2011, I took, I gave myself one week to write a book, you know, however long I was able to write. So like 72 pages, I stapled it uh, by hand. And then, you know, I, I launched it within Google, very successful. Then, you know, I had the PDF, so I spread outside. It went to Stanford and, you know, eventually ended up teaching this material at Stanford. No, so the, the prototype of the book, people gave me skin in the game. How? No, it was free, right? It's a PDF. But skin in the game can also be your time. So anybody who reads the book gives me skin in the game, makes me think that they really want it. And some people, it's been translated into a dozen languages by volunteer. That's more evidence of skin in the game. So having collected enough evidence, I decided, okay, I'm going to spend, you know, the nine months or whatever to write a proper book. And fortunately, the book was successful. I got a very nice advance. I earned the advance. So the publisher made money. I made money. And, you know, more importantly, these ideas are out in the, in the world. So it even reached you, Stuart. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I love the story around that as well. And this this whole um, concept of prototyping is, is very, very clever. I, I'll, I also um, I came up with an idea um, for a, 
a, a navigation tool for uh, tourists to take them around cities and and um, and sort of introduce them to uh, um, to towns they'd never been before. Um, sort of a, a GPS based device long before smartphones mm -hmm. ever came along. And I also did this, and but I didn't realize I'd done it at the time. I just created a little box and I painted it green and I put a piece of card in where the, the display Beautiful. should have been, put a nice little band around it and and um, and tried that out. And um, it really, you know, you're right, it, it really works as a, as a way of, of getting a feel for it and, and, uh, and understanding it a bit more detail. But when we look at your book and some of the things you're suggesting, so we've already seen your audio device. You've you've basically gone and, and created a website, and and you've got one example of a, a box that doesn't do anything. But at the same time, you're sort of indicating that you do have a product and it is working. Uh, and there's a certain amount of sort of faking going on in in some of these pre prototyping ideas. That's going to cross some ethical guidelines for some. How do some of the people you've worked with um, who use this pre-typing examples, how do they tackle that ethical issue? Yeah, so I would say out of the dozen plus pre-typing techniques I teach, there is only one that could be misused. And that's the right term. You can misuse it in an unethical way. Uh, but, you know, that, that's a, any product, any idea, any technology uh, can be misused. And that is what uh, was known as the fake door. Right. So you don't have the product and you just pretend that you have the product. Now, unless you actually collect money uh, from investors or for people who buy it and you cannot deliver the product, you know, it, it's not uh, uh, unethical. I give you many techniques or how to make sure that you're 100% ethical in all your or pitotyping. In fact, I could not teach this material at Stanford if it did not pass an ethical review uh, board, right? We don't want students to get uh, uh, to get into trouble. So it's perfectly ethical. In fact, it's even been prototyping has been used in medicine. There is an article on the New England Journal of Medicine, kind of the premier uh, 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 journal on medicine, where they actually refer to my first book, Prototype It, because in medicine, just like you know, in electronics and other areas, it is so important that the, the smart people that develop solutions that they, they develop solutions, say, and treatments that people will actually use, right? Otherwise, it's a colossal waste of time. Just because you have a cure doesn't mean that people will buy the cure. Maybe it's too expensive, maybe it's too painful, maybe it takes uh, too long. So pre-tapping can be ethical. And now, since you ask about it, I'll tell you my... So this is the individual answer, right? Make sure that every pre tap you do is ethical. And if you read in the book, I teach you exactly how to do it. So it's a win-win-win. The other one is a much bigger ethical thing. So I'm not thinking about a specific product, but about the whole ethics of innovation. So the technology we develop solves problems. It also creates a lot of problems, right? Entrepreneurs and innovators are one of our most valuable resources, if not the most valuable resource for moving forward. So the biggest ethical problem, in my opinion, is people uh, uh, be, uh, not teaching entrepreneurs and innovators the right technique to make sure that they use their resources to build product that the world and the market actually uh, use and need. So when you do prototyping, you do a very, very small investment. You run small tests on a small sample of people, right? So you could just do a prototype, even a fake door on 100 people out of a market of possibly hundreds of millions. If you do it ethical, very, very few people are affected. The most thing that are affected Right, they click the button. Right, so this yeah. is the worst that can happen in a fake door. You click the button, say I want to buy, and you say, "I'm sorry, the product is not available." Right, uh, but since thank you for expressing your interest. So think about it. By them clicking the button, it means that they want the product, and they've given a vote that they want the product. Therefore, helping you to build the product. Right. So it's a feedback loop. It's, it's all. Uh, uh, very good. And usually what I do is say, look, I'm sorry, you know, my, my full book doesn't exist yet, but I'll send you a free copy of Pretotype It in return. Or I'll send yeah. you, you know, if they want to buy the device, I said, look, I'll, I'll send you this other control or another gift. So the whole thing is uh, ethical and we don't have to deal with the mess of products that you build and then they end up in landslide or companies with great, great innovators that spend years building products nobody wants. So that's a bigger ethical question. That's why, in my opinion, there's nothing more ethical and necessary than pre-totapping. It's just like testing a drug in the market for effectiveness before actually investing to build it, develop yeah. it. 
Yeah, I, th I think it, it balances it all, uh, itself out. And I think um, the, the most important thing is to sort of read carefully those those pre-typing um, suggestions in the book and and working out what what would work for you in your case and, and also how you feel feel about those. One of the other big things that comes out of the book um, re with regard to this pre-typing process uh, and something that occurred to me as I was reading it was um, in a country like Germany, where I live, we, we love our laws, we love our regulation, and uh, we really love having insurance. Um, when, when I look at some of the pre-typing ideas, um, some of those in a, in a group of people, especially some of the companies I've worked with in the past, they, they would just fall apart at the mere thought of, of sort of like the data protection discussions. You know, do we have GDPR in place um, and, all this, and all these sort of things? Or, um, you know, the, your, one of your ideas was to sort of offer, offer training on a, on a bus on the way to work and you, 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 you hire a bus and, and everyone gets on it. And, uh, but there's no discussion of like, oh, are we, are we liability insured? Um, for this, you know, for this one week of trying it out, are we at risk of stifling our innovation um, because of these, the, you know, these these issues? And uh, how do people sort of uh, that you've worked with get around these types of things? Yeah. So f first of all, very good question. Uh, I work with a number of uh, German companies, including very very conservative German companies, and yeah, one of the things I said, you know, th there's two issues. One of them, the regulation, the other one, and you can confirm it, Stuart, for me, is like the fear of failure, right? So they say, well, if, if we cannot fail, you know, even if it's an experiment, we don't want to fail. We want to make sure that whatever we build is going to be successful. So here's what actually, th this is the theory, right? So this is thought land. People are afraid. Oh, well, what about regulation, insurance, laws, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these things in, 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 in the actual real implementation of crypto types, very rarely, if ever have to be an issue for not uh, or an excuse for not building a prototype, they are used once again as excuses of not going ahead and doing the experiment of wanting to have everything perfect because uh, before launching the product. And once again, what happens is that in order to avoid a small level of embarrassment, you know, uh, maybe a little failure, you know, experiments cannot fail, but you know, maybe some people are afraid of little failure, then they're facing the problem of much bigger failure. So companies that don't want to take some risks to innovate, they take the much bigger risk is that they're going to be out, uh, out innovated, right? So it's a big failure with a big red capital, uh, capital F. Whatever idea you're planning to develop, there is a spectrum. So there is the idea is here, right? The, the full end product is here, right? So in this spectrum between just having the idea and thought line and the fan and the end products or, or even the prototype, there are many, many steps that could be prototyping. So think about what is the smallest thing, smallest artifacts you can create that does not, uh, you know, create ethical problems, that doesn't create legal problems uh, and, you know, that meets all regulations. So that's the first thing. And the, usually there is an answer that's much, much smaller, cheaper and faster to execute than the full bone uh, prototype. The other thing uh, that, that, that I would like uh, to point out is that, yes, there are regulation. I did a, a YouTube video called uh, ignorance, uh, you know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is that you, not that you ignore the law, kind of break the laws, but uh, the, the fact that there is a law and that your idea will, at this current time, possibly go against that law, doesn't mean that you shouldn't try that innovation. I'll give you a perfect example. When Google started working on self-driving cars, maybe 10 years ago, I forget the exact date, right? And I saw the first version of the Google self-driving cars. My thought was not, this cannot build it, you know, it will never work. I knew it will, they would build it and eventually it would work. It may take time. My concern was, this will never, you know, there are no laws. You're not allowed to have a car without a driver on the road. But here's what happens. If there is a market, there is a way. The laws will change. I live in Mountain View, California, right? A Googleville, as we call it. And I started five years ago seeing self-driving cars all around. Initially, you know, with a backup driver. And now I just see them without anybody uh, in the driver's seat. So just because there are laws and regulation now, it does not mean that they will be laws and regulation in the future and the companies and the countries that are willing 
to prototype and try new laws are the ones that are going to succeed. So what happened here in California with Google, with self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they didn't make a mandate all over the place. So they did small tests in small areas. They got permissions to try self-driving cars unassisted in small areas. And then using that experiment, you know, they will eventually expand it. So don't use re laws, regulation, insurance. I mean, if you need insurance, buy insurance, right? I'm not saying that it has to be free. So for the bus, you example, say, well, we're going to have to spend $1,000 per trip in insurance because it's a one-off. Well, spend it. I'm not saying that it has to be free, but it's definitely much, much cheaper than building the full thing and then insuring that. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a great approach. And, and you know, like you say, balancing the, the options that are on the table, um, analyzing the risk and, and, and seeing what's possible. And I think we're, we're sort of seeing a similar situation, aren't we, with um, with artificial intelligence and chat GPT and, um, and all these things as well. They've, they've sort of been created, but we, we haven't got any regulations and we're doing the regulations now. And, um, and you know, that, that's often the way it works, isn't it? So we've got to the point now where we've, we're clear, clear that sort of the, your own data, this Yoda is, is key for fine tuning um, your startup idea, it's going to give you a lot more confidence. And, and also one of the stories you give in the book um, around the bus idea actually um, is very good because you see how the initial idea changes. The, the more people you talk to, the more people who sort of buy into it, um, it actually changes the idea and, and, and brings it into something that's more manageable. Um, so that that works works really well but also from an, another perspective you can imagine that there's a, like a risk of paralysis by analysis by you know, keep going out and you know finding fine tuning the idea and, and getting more data um is, is that a real risk or are people sort of a little bit more sensible and and uh you know quickly come to a decision as to how they're going to progress yeah it's a real risk but not with prototyping right if you prototype you, you say uh, there is no paralysis, right? <laughs> there, there is no analysis. I'm saying build something, you know, even if it's a can of beans, right? Uh, we could be and go and start using it. So it's the opposite of paralysis uh, by uh, by analysis. Now you still collect data, but as you've read in the book, right? Uh, paralysis by analysis happens in some scenario. One, you want to make sure that everything is perfect. Right. So, you know, again, using the romantic dating example, you want to ask somebody on a date and you say, well, yeah, I'm, first, I'm going to make sure that everything is right. You know, clean up the apartment, you know, get my hair, you know, lose some weight, whatever, whatever your criteria uh, is. And 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 then you, you just don't move, you know, and by the time you make the move, they found another partner. Right. <laughs> so that's analysis by paralysis. In my case, with prototyping, I say start engaging with the market right now. So collect data. Furthermore, in the book, I tell you, you know, uh, I tell you when you have when you have reached enough data to say I'm comfortable launching the product. Right. So it's not an infinite number of experiments. Each experiment will either confirm your hypothesis, you know, give you more confidence or that, that your product will succeed or, you know, will not confirm it. So I give you a, a very simple model a method. Right. Remember the one with the with the arrows. Uh, for determining how many experiments you need to do, how much data you need to collect to, the, to make a go, no go decision. So first of all, there is no paralysis because I tell you, first thing, build something today, you know, put it online tomorrow and start to collect uh, data. And then also I tell you when you can stop collecting uh, data. So uh, paralysis by analysis is a very real thing. It happens in thought and I have this great idea that never materialized. Instead, with prototyping, I said, get off your butt this instant. And you have no excuses, right? It took me five minutes to build this prototype, right? And uh, get going. Super. We're, we're coming close to the, the end of our interview. And a couple of things have, have popped into my mind as, as we've um, been talking, a couple of additional um, thoughts. So uh, one of these is um, in terms of the, the testing of the hypothesis. You know, you, you think you have a market. Um, and, and you're going through this pre-typing process, gathering your your own data, your Yoda. Um, I think there's there's a tool on the website uh, or like an Excel spreadsheet on the website which people can download um, to help them with that a bit. And, and what else what else is out there on the website to sort of help people through this this process? Yeah, there's a lot. You know, my my mission is to help other entrepreneurs not fail. So I'm, I'm fighting against failure, right? I call it the beast of failure. So uh, pretty much everything I do, it's it's other free. Like my book, is booklet is free, right? The book, you know, the publishers have to make some money. 
I make what a buck fifty on every copy sold. So that's not my get rich quick scheme. So, but if you search for Alberto Savoy and Prito Tapping, there are a lot of resources. I have a few dozen videos that cover each and every aspect of the Prito Tapping model. And uh, so just lots of resources that they can use there, including uh, calculators, uh, spreadsheets. And, you know, if you like math, so a lot of, you know, if, if you're building electronics, probably you're, you're familiar with maps, you know, how to calculate, you know, RLC circuit. So my math is much simpler than what you use in most um, electronics, but it follows the same principles, Stuart, right? So if I'm building a circuit, right, uh, you don't want to have any things that are unnecessary, right? You say, well, I would like to put a resistor here just for, because it looks good, right? Uh, it look, looks like a, like a B. I like resistors, right? Or, uh, or you don't take out anything that is necessary. So in all of my work, I try to simplify to what is uh, necessary and sufficient. So the one thing we did not discuss by name that I would like to make sure that people check out is what I call the XYZ hypothesis. That is, you, we talked about the business plan, business plan, forget the business plan, the for, forget canvases even, you know, you can do a canvas later. Begin by writing an XYZ hypothesis, which has the format, at least X percent of Y will do Z. So why is your target market? So let's say my people who buy, you know, audio files, right? Uh, who, who buy audio equipment. Uh, will 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 do z what is z is the action say will they will buy the delicious one tone control for say 499 dollars by the way i'm not selling it so you know i'm not building it anymore <laughs> it's just an example right so i'm not pushing anything but just it's just a great example because i've i've done it so uh, oh, there, there is a whole process there so an x percent is a percentage of of your target market that needs to buy your product for it to make it buy to make it worthwhile building Right. So let's say there is a million audiophile in the US. Well, no, that's a lot. Hundred thousand. Right. And I'm selling this device. I'll make it easy for four hundred dollars. And I want to make at least ten thousand dollars. So I need to reach. I, I use those numbers to calculate the X percentage of the market that I need. And then all of a sudden you have your entire business plan condensed in a very, very simple one line formula, which could be at least. 0.5% of US audiophile will buy a delicious one for $500. So that's a hypothesis and it's testable. How do you test it? Well, maybe you have the landing page, you ask for a deposit, you ask for an email, and using that, you can validate the hypothesis before you go out and you build 1,000 of these that end up in your garage. By the way, I've had friends, you know, best family friends who have read the book, who thinks it's great, and then they had an idea and they went and spent you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and patenting this and patenting that and ended up with all of these boxes of their gizmos in the garage because they realized, well, now we have it. Now it's easy. Selling it is the easy part. And then they realized, no, no, yeah. guys, we, if we're engineers, we know how to build it, right? Did you have any doubt that you could build your, you know, your idea for the tourists? No, you know, it's, no. it's buildable. All the risk is in the market. Will people actually buy? So I help people de-risk that so you can go to what you love doing which is building the gizmos right firing up the oscilloscope and the soldering iron or the compiler and building it and let me tell you so Stuart after having done this for a long time and I've learned that uh you know how hard it is to build products whether it's hardware and software the the kind of energy and enthusiasm and motivation you know when you have say 10,000 people that have already paid you know 50 dollar deposits for you you know that there is a market, right? I'll, I'll give you my one final example, Tesla with the Model 3, right? So Tesla uh, said, okay, now we wanna build a cheaper car. But you know, building a cheaper car in quantities, you have to invest $2 billion to build a factory. So how did they validate that there would be a market for it, you know, to motivate people to work hard? Apparently Tesla works people very, very hard, right? 20 hour days. Uh, well, they, if you remember on April 1st, um, I think it was 1996, Elon Musk showed a, 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 an image of what the Tesla Model 3 would look like, right? So it wasn't running. It didn't have the factory to produce it and said, if you would like one, uh, no, 20, 2016, 2019, I forget the exact date. So it doesn't matter. Uh, on the, I remember it was April 1st. If you're interested, send us a $1,000 deposit. On April 2nd, the next day, that over 270000 one. 270,000 deposits for $1,000 each. So more than a quarter billion dollars in the bank. 
So, Stuart, would you say that based on that, there was interest in the Tesla Model uh, 3? I, I I would say that's quite compelling, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of skin in the game, right? It is, yeah. Right? Because I was, was going to ask the question, actually. The though. entire market for mid, mid-sized luxury sedan in the U.S., right? Yeah. So, so that, that that's like, actually, it's half the market. So 600,000 are sold each year, and they had deposit for 276,000. It's like capture, you know, by, by, by BMW, Audi, and Mercedes, right? So there's a lot to learn there for the German uh, automakers. So that's how you collect um, data with skin in the game before going yeah. and spending $2 million to build a factory. I was, I was going to ask, do you, do you get extra skin in the game for um, launching something on, on April Fool's Day, on April the 1st, and, I, and, and people still being convinced that they want to buy it? The, you, that's that's very clever. Yes, I I call it the best case and the worst case scenario, right? So if you do it on April's full and people still give you a thousand dollars, it means that they really want it. Because also when I saw it, and it was April's full, you know, and you go look on Twitter and you know there are all these jokes in the news. I thought, yeah, maybe this is just uh, this is just a a joke. Now companies have tried to do the same. You know, I won't name names, asking for a deposit. So you know, a, a U.S. automaker also asked for a deposit of $100, right, for $80,000 electric truck. Now, to me, $100, yes, it's a little bit of skin in the game. Yeah, yeah. but it's it's not enough, right? So if it's a $40,000 car, $1,000 truck, you want su- substantial um, uh, skin in the game. Yeah, exactly. Super. I think that's a, that's a, a um, some very excellent examples there, and, and sort of I think that helps to make it a bit more tangible how how the whole process then sort of uh, comes comes together. Um, one of the uh, sort of not related to um, to to this uh, to the book and, and the pre-typing process, but going back to your um, experience as a, as an entrepreneur and working with um, investors. So um, just to give people an idea, because I've probably never seen a VC and, and never had seed investment and, and funding and that sort of thing. If someone comes along and they one of these investors gives you $25 million for your company um, and you run your company and you get to the point like you did where it suddenly you say, sorry, this this is just not going to work. Yeah. Uh, what what happens to the, you know, is there any uh, liability for that money? What happens to what's <laughs> left over? What, what sort of what's the process? <laughs> It's funny that you mentioned, right? So as I said, I come from Italy. So uh, when I when I told my mother we raised twenty five million dollars, she kind of interpreted you borrowed twenty five million dollars. She'll say, "Oh my God, that's terrible!" Right? No. So one of the beauties of Silicon Valley and the VC ecosystem is that no, the, the, there is no liability for you. There's just the embarrassment, right? Uh, the VCs they know exactly what they're doing, right? In fact, I've done a series of videos called "How to Bet Like Bezos" or "Bet Like a VC." Uh, ABCs, you know, they make many, many little bets. You know, they know that some will pay 100x and they can absorb all the losses and, you know, and be incredibly successful. So don't feel bad for the investors, right? But feel bad for you because you've spent, you know, years, uh, years of your time, which is non, uh, which is non-replaceable. Yeah, so there, there are no liabilities if you do it ethically. Now, if you're not ethical, remember my, my slogan is make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. Right. So, uh, you know, in, in the news recently, right, you know, Theranos is an example of what not to do. They, they didn't build it right. They, they, they weren't sure that they could build it. They collected money. They sold the product. Right. So they collected a substantial skin in the game, which they did not return for products that then they could not uh, deliver. So in those cases, there is liability. But in the case when everything is above board, above board Everything is specified. You know, all the printed apps are there. All the data is collected. No, there is no liability uh, uh, in Silicon Valley. Just a little bit of embarrassment to have a loss on your track record. But you know what? Uh, actually, it's kind of a badge of honor. <laughs> it's a badge of honor, right? Because if you have never failed, it means you have you have not uh, pushed enough. Having said that, success tastes much much sweeter than uh, failure. Well, you seem to have done okay out of it. You don't seem to have uh, dented your um, uh, excitement about startups and, and new ideas and businesses. So I think that's a good example for everyone to take with them. Yeah, so I, I if, found a new mission to help stop people from failing unnecessarily. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we come to uh, our last question for day today. I have um, just this this uh, this last point. So hand on heart, Alberto. Have you ever seen anyone discover their right it 
and despite the funding and the competent team still fail with their startup. Oh yeah, of, of course. You know, by handing out to me now, to, to tell, be honest, is that what yeah. it means? Okay, yeah. So yes, of course. Right. So here's the thing: uh, the idea can be the right it, but as I write in the book, it is not guaranteed that you are the one that are going to succeed, right? So if an idea is the right it, means that there is a market for it. If there is a market, there is a way. What happens? So I'll I'll give you very common scenarios, right? There are many many ways that you could fail, and those are the unavoidable failure. So you. Let, let's assume, remember the, the idea you came up for the tourist application you know, to go and visit things, right? So let's use that, okay? So it's a right hit, there is demand, you build your box, you do everything, and then Apple comes up with a smartphone and, you know, for, for 100 investment, people just put some software together in a couple of months and they have an app that does exactly what your hardware uh, does at a fraction of the price, right? It's $2.99 or €2.99, and your company does not succeed, right? Now, this happens a lot, right? Think of how many apps, apps when, the, when the iPhone first launched were made obsolete because with every future generation of the iPhone, those uh, apps that you had to download and they were extra became part of the actual operating system of the, of the actual release. Yes, so you can fail even if you have the right it. That becomes a matter of execution which is not my domain of expertise. So again, the idea will, you know, if the idea is the right, it's pretty much guaranteed that it will succeed if it's viable, but there is no guarantee that you will succeed with the idea because somebody, you know, with more money, you know, with more quicker and more expertise can come and uh, pull the right from after you. So I'm sorry, Stuart, no guarantees in life, but at least it's, a, it's an avoidable failure, right? The, the thing that hurts the most if you spend five, million dollars building it and then you launch it and you realize and i get emails like that every week i wish i'd read your book before because that yeah. five-year failure i could have learned in five days that nobody would have actually bought the product well thank you ever so much alberto it's been very inspirational to talk to you and and explore this this idea of the right it i, I personally feel you're on on the right track and um, i'm very grateful for the the experience you've shared because as you say it provides a a shortcut and um you know we've seen so many seemingly good products uh, fall by the wayside with a lot of money spent um that really needn't have happened and i think um yeah this is definitely uh, one of the the books which will be used in the future by lots of business people uh, because it's just full of wisdom so thank you very much thank you so much Stuart. great questions and again uh, my heart you know as you've seen from my Pro prototypes, not the prototype. I, I love electronic stuff. So I think uh, uh, Electro is a great magazine. And, and I tell you, if the people that are watching you, if you build stuff, you know, apply the same rigor and experimental attitude to testing the market as you do with testing and designing your product. It, it just makes sense and you, your chances of success will just uh, skyrocket. Alberto Savoia there, my expert for this episode and author of the book, the right it. Why so many ideas fail and how to make sure yours succeed. Well, that's all we have time for in this episode. So what did we learn? It's very easy to get passionate about your own ideas, but will you find others equally excited enough to give you money for them? Most business plans, according to Alberto, are a work of fiction, relying heavily on other people's data to prove the existence of a market. Instead, he recommends getting a whole bunch of Yoda, your own data, by proving that future customers are willing to put skin in the game. That could be by showing interest uh, through them giving you their email address for updates, paying a deposit, or even being willing to place a binding order before the product exists. Core to this process is pre-to-typing, a degree of fake it till you make it, coupled with an engineer's discipline applying the same rigor and experimental attitude to testing the market as you do with testing and designing your product. Thanks to today's expert, the engineer and author, Alberto Savoia. You've delivered us with some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of industry trends this year, 
take a look at News Bites, our monthly 15 minute show. Please like, subscribe to Elector TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining, stay in touch and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.